You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to Our Refocus Radio, man. We are here once again. Today, we have another amazing show lineup for today. Man, today, we're going to talk to our special guest, Holly Francis. She is not just a book author who recently wrote Life Support, Surviving GB Syndrome. I'm going to have her pronounce it. I did the safety route this week because I didn't want to mispronounce this, but she has an amazing story of not just motherhood, but also about hope and recovery. And first and foremost, I just want to welcome you, Holly Francis, to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing really good today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm in Canada and it's like minus 40 (laughs) where I am. So looking forward to being on the call with you and uh, sharing my story with your listeners. Man, it's cold, man. It's it's that time. It's perfect time for Christmas though. But going to your story, kind of give the audience a little backdrop because in today's time, you're, you're also into fitness as well. So you're helping people in, in that space. But kind of gives the backstory of what you had to go through. And it was a scare. Absolutely. So it's, it's a long journey and it goes back uh, about 12 years ago. So in uh, February of 2011. So I had just given birth uh, to my daughter. Uh, my daughter's now 12. It's been 12 years since this all happened. Uh, but at the time, I was 26 years old. I was completely healthy and I had just given birth. I had a wonderful pregnancy. I was newly married, had just bought a house. And I was in my 20s and I just felt like I had my entire life ahead of me. And I had just so much excitement and, and, and so many plans for the future. And then everything just changed so drastically. And, and uh, I just realized how quickly life can change in the blink of an eye. So what had happened is I was at home with my daughter and I was recovering from a C-section. Uh, she would have been just over three weeks old. It was February, so it was very, very cold here in Canada. I had barely left the house, just adjusting to life as a new mom and a life, uh, you know, getting used to the late night feedings and uh, all the diaper changes and, and all that. So it was, it was new, but it was so exciting. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm, I'm at home and I get this weird tingle in my fingertip. And I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe I I had burnt myself on something, Uh, but just tried to ignore it. I knew that I hadn't burnt myself. So I I, I just figured it was just something, something strange happening. Just ignored it. And then within about an hour or two, uh, I all of a sudden had this strange pain in the back of my neck. And I thought maybe I had just kinked my neck or slept on it wrong, but the pain was quite quite sudden and, and very severe. So I took some pain medication and again, just try to ignore it. And then I'm going about my day and, and I walk up the stairs and I was having a hard time lifting my legs up and lifting them up onto the next step. And I remember thinking, I, I must be getting the flu or like, why do I feel so drained? I just feel really tired. And I th- thought, you know what? I just really need a good night's sleep. So again, just tried to ignore it. Um, unfortunately, every just everything just progressed very quickly. So the tingling in my finger and this pain in my neck and this weakness in my legs, feeling like my legs were rubber, just got worse as like as the minutes went by. Like I'm not even talking hours. It was it was so sudden and so so quick. And eventually, I went online and I I googled it because I'm like, well, it's, something's wrong with me, and, and that's what you do, right? When you you think something's wrong with you, yeah. so I, I Google what what is happening, and it came up that I had a pinched nerve. So that's what I thought. And I went to bed that night in in severe pain and just having this weakness in my legs, but thinking I just needed a good night's sleep, went to bed and the pain just got worse and I took more pain medication and eventually I get, got up basically to, my daughter was crying and I got up to go to her and my legs completely gave out on me. And that's when I knew that something was seriously wrong with me. So I had my husband at the time, I had him drop me off at the ER and uh, I, I walked in there. I was I was feeling weak, but I, I didn't appear like anything was really wrong with me. So I go into the ER and I, I told my husband at the time to just drop me off because uh, I didn't want my, my daughter to be 
in the ER. So I said, just drop me off and and I will call you in a few hours once I've seen a doctor. And it's probably just a pinched nerve. I probably just need some medication. Um, I had no idea that I would not step foot out of that hospital for uh, almost four months. Wow. Once again, you're listening to Aubrey Focus Radio, talking to Holly Francis. And when that process started to take place, I mean, now you obviously find out you're not going to be leaving this hospital anytime soon. How difficult was that at the point of just your family, your normal routine, disrupting normal business? How were you able to just make adjustments? Yeah, so I had... Got to the hospital. I had seen a doctor. I was very fortunate that the doctor that I saw uh, or one of the neurologists that I was able to uh, connect with, he recognized my symptoms and said, I think you have a rare illness called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And I know it's very hard to pronounce. So that's how it's pronounced, uh, Guillain-Barre. And I remember at the time not knowing how to pronounce it, not knowing what it was. I had never heard those words before. And I'm 26 and I'm thinking, well, I've been healthy my entire life. I've never had any health issues. Uh, I just need to go home. I just need some medication. I got to get back to my baby. And the doctor said, you know what? It's a it's a very serious illness and we need to monitor how severe this gets. So we're just going to, we're going to admit you basically and you need to stay at the hospital. So I was admitted very, very quickly and I basically was, my family rushed to my side the what basically what was happening is is my body was was paralyzing me so the it's an autoimmune disorder and my body was basically attacking my nerves called causing weakness and causing paralysis and it very very quickly continued to spread eventually it spread up my body up to my diaphragm and affected my breathing and within 72 hours of my very first symptom I was put on life support and put on a ventilator to help me breathe and it was so sudden and so obviously not expected I was totally healthy and I was trying to be a new mom and suddenly I'm in ICU fighting for my life and I've got my newborn there. She's there with me and she's beside me on my bed. But I just totally felt like my life was over. And I truly didn't believe that I was I was going to get out of there for a very long time. And your daughter at the time was only three weeks old. So you were, you were in a situation where you didn't have time to be a mother. You needed yeah. to have care. What, what was Absolutely. that like for you? Absolutely. It was it was devastating for me. And I think that was the hardest part because I had wanted to be a mother since I was a little girl. I loved playing with Barbies and dolls. And I just knew that I was going to be a mom one day. And I really wanted a little girl. And of, of course, that's what I ended up having. And all of a sudden, it was just taken away from me. And we barely even had a chance to do anything together. So I'd never even got to put her in her new stroller. We'd never even really gone and visited friends much. There was just so many things that I had planned. And all of a sudden, it was just taken away from me. And when you're in life support and you're in ICU and you can't breathe and you can't talk because I had a, I had a breathing tube in my mouth and my family's trying to communicate with me, I can't move. And basically, I just felt like my life was over. I felt like there was no hope. There was no future for me. I, I didn't feel like I was ever going to get back to my baby. And I felt very robbed and just very angry at the world because I felt like everything I'd wanted for I'd, and everything I'd been working towards was just taken away from me. And and I had just nothing to live for anymore. Listen, I'm before this radio talking to, to Holly Francis. And I got to get this point of information up because this is this is pretty serious. You spent three months paralyzed from the neck down. I mean, obviously you're healthy right now, which is I think it's a miracle. But I mean, at what point did the light start to get bright for you when things start to turn around for you? Like what was that process like? How were the doctors reacting to your progress? Because looking at you right now, I mean, obviously people can see you on radio, but you look like you're living your best life right now. So <laughs> what was that process like when things start to turn around for the better? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I was in ICU for, for quite a while before any improvements showed. And when you're in that dark place and you don't think that there's any hope and you're not seeing any improvements, it was very hard to stay positive. Even though the doctors kept telling me that with Guillain-Barre syndrome, you can recover. You just have to get through the, the really difficult part and you just have to let the body heal. The body will heal itself. It just takes time. And eventually I would learn to basically use my body again. But when I was in ICU, it was so hard to, to believe that. Uh, but I found uh, strength in, in various different things. For one, my family, they were there. They were so supportive. They were by my side every day. Uh, my daughter, as much as it was very difficult for her to be there and for me to see her and not be able to reach out and hold her or, or touch her, or even say I love you to her, I couldn't do any of that. And at times I felt very worthless. But I also wanted so badly to just get back to her. And so she was a huge motivation for me. Um, and then the biggest turning point was actually another GBS survivor that uh, came to visit me. So when I was in ICU, I, I was being told that GBS is a very rare disorder and I had never heard of it. My family had never heard of it. And then all of a sudden, uh, the doctors brought in somebody that had recovered from GBS. And he walked into my room and he looked like I do now. He, he, you could not tell that he had gone through something like he, uh, he did. And uh, he had gone, he, he was actually in the same hospital room that I was and he'd recovered completely and was walking and was living his life with his family again. So it was a huge motivation and it just showed me that, you know what, if, if he can get through this, then so can I. And it gave me this this kind of spark to keep going. And eventually I was able to start learning how to breathe on my own. And it was very challenging at first, uh, learning how to breathe and getting off the ventilator. I would practice basically for 15 seconds at a time and then 30 seconds and then 45 seconds. And every time I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it and it felt like... I, I, it was. It felt so impossible. It felt like it was something that was unattainable. And every time I, I would ask them to put me back on the ventilator, and I would cry, and and I would hyperventilate, and I would say, I, I can't do this. But I would just keep trying every day, and I promised myself that I would just keep trying, and I would, I would just try again tomorrow. And so the next day, we would try again, and and over time, those fifteen seconds just gradually improved, and. It went from 15 seconds to 30 to a couple minutes and to, to 15 minutes. And gradually over several several weeks, I was able to breathe on my own and was able to get off the uh, ventilator and, and get out of ICU. And what was the timeline? Was it like about six months from the starting point uh, when you were able to be released from the hospital? Or... Yeah, it was about yeah, it was about five months actually. Um, so after I got out of ICU, I was moved to a neurology ward, and basically I had to learn how to do everything. So even though I was I, I was better and I was breathing on my own and I was showing signs of improvement, my health was coming back, and my my body was starting to move again. The process was very slowly fading. I was kind of like a, a newborn where I, I didn't have a lot of um, like I hand eye cord coordination and everything was very weak. I could barely even lift a cup. So I basically had to re-strengthen every part of my body. And I learned how to hold cutlery, how to feed myself, how to hold cups, how to brush my hair and teeth. And I did that for several weeks. I was eventually moved to a rehab hospital and that's where I eventually learned how to walk. And so first I had to strengthen my legs and then my ankles. And I, I was in a wheelchair for quite a while and then I uh, moved to a walker and then eventually moved to a cane. And then at that point was when I was strong enough to finally go home. So when I went home, my daughter was almost six months old. So it, it felt like I lost out on so much time with her. She was she had changed so much from when I was first admitted. Uh, but my motivation was, you know what, I want to walk before she does. I want to be able to run after her when she's a toddler and I want to walk her to her first day of school. So that really pushed me in physiotherapy to really, really work hard and uh, knowing what I'd overcome with breathing on my own and 
after seeing what I had deemed impossible and then and then overcoming that. And I think we kind of all have this strength within us that we really don't realize that we have until we're really put in these like horrible situations. And so that just really inspired myself that, you know what, you're so much stronger than this. You can do this. And I, I was able to walk before her and I got home and I went home after about 126 days in the hospital. And with uh, GPS, GBS, did the doctor share with you some of the stats, statistics of what the average uh, scenario is used uh, has been in the past? Because it almost yeah. sounds like you like beat the odds. Yeah. So, major. It's actually crazy. I had a very severe case. Um, only about thirty percent actually end up on a ventilator. So, about seventy percent they'll deal with paralysis, but they won't be um, on a ventilator. So, I had a very, very severe case, and they told me many times that they weren't sure if I would recover or if I would walk again. Um, and and maybe I'm just very, very privileged and and very fortunate that I was able to. But obviously, I, I worked very, very hard. Um, and I just always promised myself to just keep trying. So even after I recovered and I was back at home, my physiotherapist kind of said, you know what, your recovery is kind of on you now. Like you're, you're at home now. It's, it's up to you if you want to keep improving. And, and I, I certainly did. I wasn't back to normal. Uh, I, I had a really hard time getting down on the floor. I had a hard time walking for more than 10 minutes. My legs would get really tired. I needed to really work on my endurance and and my strength. And so I just took it upon myself knowing that, you know what, if I want to be the best that I can be, I have to work really, really hard at it. And so I started working out at home and I started doing exercises while sitting on my couch and while sitting on the floor and just doing whatever I could and going for walks. And I remember I was so weak still at that point that I had a hard, hard time walking without something to hold on to. So I used my daughter's stroller and we we went for walks around the block and I just continued to push myself and I didn't set limitations. I didn't say that anything was too challenging. I said, let's just just try it. So I actually got into yoga first uh, just because I dealt with a lot of weakness and, and pain and a lot of tightness. So I started with that. And I remember I went to a class for like senior citizens and I was I was 20, I would have been 27 at the time, but the youngest person in the class. And they were doing all these exercises that I couldn't do. But by the end of the class, I was able to do it. And I got stronger and stronger as the weeks went by. And eventually I got into strength training and, and eventually I got into the best shape of my life, fell in love with fitness and really just wanted to give back and show others that, you know what, like if I can go from where I did, which was rock bottom and literally paralyzed, my body literally did not work um, to being in the best shape of my life and and being as strong as I can, that uh, there's a lot of faith and there's a lot of uh, room for, for hard work. And so I, I help other people now t- and show them that they can overcome hard things as well. I mean, yeah, that's a good point for the audience to know you're a certified trainer. <laughs> I am, yeah. Wow. I mean... You literally went from not being able to move to being able to help train people and, and inspire people through fitness. I mean, that if that don't inspire somebody, I mean, it's <laughs> like, wow. I mean, you was already working hard, and then you had a yeah. situation that happened to you, and you, you had to double, triple, quadruple the work to <laughs> yeah. get to, like, a normal way of living. I mean, we... A lot of us take a lot of things for granted, like doing the basics, walking, moving our arms, you know, holding things because it's those details that allows you to live your life to the fullest. It's that part of your message, too, when you're talking to people to, you know, not take things for granted when you when you have things, appreciate them because it can be taken away. Absolutely. Like. When I was recovering from GBS and I was in the hospital, um, I'm in the rehab hospital, I, I, the, with GBS, it's a rare disease. So there's really nowhere for the, us to go. So we went on a spinal cord injury ward and everybody on that department was basically in a wheelchair for the rest of their lives, dealing with broken backs, broken necks. So it was very humbling for me to know that eventually I was going to get out of there and I was going to get out of a wheelchair, which I did. 
And it really inspired me that, you know what, I know that they would want me to use my body in the best of my abilities and and they would love to exercise if they could. And so that's partly why I got into exercise. Um, And then why I got into fitness training is just after I recovered and uh, after I, I started sharing my story because I wanted to bring awareness to to Guillain-Barre syndrome that no one, most, almost nobody has heard of. And I wanted people to learn about this disease and learn how, how devastating it is. And it it affects people of all ages and it can happen to anybody, uh, people of all ages, races all over the world. Um, And so I just started sharing my story. I started talking about on social media. I started um, an actual social media Facebook page and Instagram page called Holly After. After GBS. And then all of a sudden, I had all these people around the world reaching out to me saying, I had GBS too. And thank you for sharing your story. And how did you overcome that? And how did you get in, into good shape? And what did you do for exercises? And, and that's when I decided to pursue my uh, fitness training certification because I, I wanted to have the tools in place to give them the proper knowledge. Once again, listen, I'll be focused radio talking to Holly Francis, and I can finally say the words now, uh, Guillaume Bray uh, syndrome <laughs> <Good job. laughs> that, that you overcame. And I can only imagine the doctors are also like probably talking to you and maybe, I mean, I was it been like, because you, you not just have been on the news and other platforms talking about this, but have doctors reach out to you to maybe kind of study you or ask you questions, research? They have, yeah, quite a bit. And I think that's just with help of social media and by being very vocal about what I went through. Um, I've had a lot of doctors reach out to me, thanking me for sharing my story and uh, them even learning about it because doctors, if they've never seen a case of it before, they don't truly understand it. So unless they've ever had a patient with it, they don't get it. And so when they do have a patient, there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of um, questions that they may have. And so that's what brought me to uh, writing my book and my new book, um, Life Support. And I have a lot of doctors and nurses that have reached out to me and and have had me even come to hospitals, visit patients. They have had me speak to medical students just so that they can better understand uh, what it's like to go through this disease. Because even though they may study it. They may some of the, some of these doctors deal with it um, on a regular basis, even, uh, but they do, they truly don't know what it's like to go through it. So, and speaking on what you do as far as training and helping people with fitness, I mean, I mean, your pitch must be amazing. I mean, people probably say say no more, sign me up. I mean. <laughs> You can't go wrong if someone like you is into fitness and with your storyline. Uh, how, how has the community been as far as supporting you uh, being a trainer? Oh, it's been amazing. And I think the best part has been working with GBS patients. So I I mean, I, I work with a variety of people, but to have GBS survivors that have gone through what I did and to come to me not knowing what they're capable of and then showing them and, and regain, helping them regain their strength has been so rewarding. Once again, listen, I'll be focused radio talking to our guest today. She is Holly Francis. You can go to her website, hollyaftergbs.com. And you also get the book about her beating this uh, this this disorder, uh, Gian Bray. I'm gonna get it, Gian Bray. And your book, Life Support, is is fairly new. So hopefully, you can blow up the numbers for you and, and get people mm-hmm. checking this out. Why is it so important for you to use your platform now to bring more awareness to this and to shed light that there's still hope? Uh, For many different reasons. I think after going through what I did when I was in the hospital and for such a long period of time, I was so hopeless and felt like there was no reason to keep fighting. Uh, Clearly there was, and I'm so glad that I had the support system that I did and the inspiration that I did. Uh, But I just never want anyone to go through that um, thinking that they can't get through and uh, because they can and I'm living proof. So I want my story uh, to remind people that are obviously going through GBS that they can get through it. But not only that, 
um, anybody that's kind of going through any really difficult time in their life. I, I know at the time it feels like you're never going to overcome this. Um, but, but if you just, you know, just keep trying every day and keep fighting for yourself, one day it'll be this distant memory, which it is for me. And, and it actually ended up being this huge blessing for me. I can't even imagine not going through it now. It changed my life. Uh, it, it's given me s- a, such a sense of gratitude for being a mother. And like you said, being able to walk and basic things like breathing. And I've used that to my advantage. I, I, I'm, I'm much more adventurous. I do things that I've always wanted to do, things that I said, you know what, I'll probably do that when I'm like 50, but life is so short. And so now I, I go after the goals that I want and I, I do things that, I, that I've i always wanted to do. And I think everyone should just live like that because you just never know when life can change. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I want to assume that you feel great today. But tell the audience in your own words, how do you really feel now? I feel great. Um, I, I still deal with some residuals from my illness, um, but I don't let it hold me back. And uh, I, I truly do believe that everything that happened in my life it put me exactly where I was supposed to be. And it, I just, I've really focused on the blessings that came out of it. Instead of focusing on, you know what, I lost six months of my life. I lost six months of my daughter's life. I missed her first smile. I never got to take her on her first walk. I missed all these moments. And I could focus on that, but I choose not to. I really choose to focus on the good that came out of that. The fact that I can bring awareness to GBS, there's not a lot of people that are. Uh, I can connect with other survivors. I've got a bond that I, with my daughter that I don't know if I would have had um, otherwise. So I, I really encourage people to just look for, you know, whatever struggle you're going through, try to find those blessings in them. And you want to definitely get a book on Amazon. You can get it uh, right now. Life Support, I'll put it in the description. Once again, talking to our guest today, Holly Francis, you can go to her website, hollyaftergbs.com. And if you just go to the media room and check out some of the press she's been able to get, it's pretty amazing. I mean, you've been on CBC News, Daily Mail, uh, a lot of different platforms and a lot of like local news channels. And when you're able to have that voice for, for people and build that community of, of just showing people that there is hope no matter what you go through in life. In closing, holiday season, New Year's coming around, what would you share with the audience as far as a message of encouragement just in case someone might be going through a rough patch? I would say to just never give up. Know that, you know what, there's going to be hard days. And I went through so many days that I didn't think that I was going to get through it, but just promising that yourself that you're, you're going to try again tomorrow. Know that, you know what, that bad day might happen. You let it go and and try again tomorrow. Another thing that I would really strongly suggest is it's hard uh, when you're struggling, but trying to reach out to other people, uh, finding even that tribe, like just anybody that might be going through something similar to what you're going through, because that can be your kind of light that helps you through that dark tunnel. This time, um, Refocus Radio, talking to Holly Francis. Go to her website again, hollyaftergbs.com. Get her book on Amazon Life Support. It'll be in the, script, in the description. Man, I want to say once again, thank you to you, Holly, for taking time on your schedule talking to Army Focus Radio today. Thank you so much for having me. It was great. 